Welcome everyone. We are happy to welcome you to today's Brown Bag in Science webinar. The goal of this webinar series is to familiarize our ACSM students with the breadth of science that our ACSM members conduct. Today we are really excited to have Dr. Katie Potter as our presenter. So I'm going to start with a few housekeeping items. If you have trouble hearing or seeing the webinar, please hang up and then rejoin the webinar. It's most likely a problem with your internet connection. Our presenter will talk for about 30 minutes and then we will have time for question and answers. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please type them into the GoToWebinar question area on, on your screen. If you purchased a CEC for today's webinar, you need to watch the entire webinar to receive your CEC. The one CEC will be applied to your ACSM account within two weeks. When the CEC is accessible, an email will be sent to, to the verified viewers with instructions on how to access the CEC documentation. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about our presenter. Katie Potter, PhD, is an assistant professor of kinesiology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She earned her master's from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and her PhD at the University of South Carolina. She also completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Miriam Hospital Brown Medical School. Her research focuses on leveraging the human-dog bond to promote physical activity. Since many people do not like to exercise or find it difficult to fit into their busy lives, her research involves promoting activities that people enjoy or deeply value and that get them moving as a side effect. She's also very interested in the mental, social, and physical health benefits of the human-animal bond and a focus of her lab is developing and testing dog-facilitated physical activity interventions. So with that, uh, welcome, Katie, and we're gonna turn it over to you for your presentation. All right, great. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera off so that you guys can see the screen a little bit bigger and better. Um, thank you so much for having me, um, and I'm gonna go ahead and just jump right in. I'm gonna start my timer so I don't talk too much because I could talk all day about this topic, which again is leveraging the human-dog bond to promote physical activity. Okay, so with my talk today, I am going to attempt to answer three primary questions. So the first question, what do I study? The second, why is it important or why do I think it's important? And the third is why might it be important to you, to the viewers today? All right, so part one, what do I study? My primary research question is this, how can we leverage the human-animal bond to promote physical activity and health across the lifespan? So this really could be narrowed to how can we leverage the human-dog bond to promote physical activity and mental health, social connectedness, cognitive health, uh, physical health, um, lots of different aspects of health, but I'm particularly interested in psychosocial um, health benefits. The general research methodologies I use, so here I have the study designs I use and the, the main measures that I tend to collect. So I use both observation, observational and experimental study designs, and I usually primarily focus on collecting physical activity and psychosocial data. So I always uh, use accelerometers, either Actographs or ActivePals, to collect my physical activity data. So they're monitors that people usually wear on their hip or on the front of their thigh. And I always pair that with some sort of self-report. Since I'm interested in dog walking, I need that context. I need people to tell me what they're doing. Um, and there's always survey data collection in my research. So people tell me um, about their depressive symptoms, their perceived stress levels, their fear of falling, um, perceived feelings of loneliness. So it depends on my population um, and the study that I'm doing. So I wanna give you guys a couple of actual examples from studies uh, in my lab. I'm gonna start by talking about two studies that are just getting off the ground now, so hot off the press, uh, and then two previous studies completed in my lab that are both published open access so you guys can find those papers if you're interested. Okay, so the two studies I'm excited to tell you about um, that we are just kicking off, they're both observational studies. So here's my observational study examples. I'm gonna to talk to you about the lifestyle brain and cognitive health study, which we call the dog brain study and our kid study, which is, stands for kids interacting with dogs. 
So in the dog brain study, um, what are we doing? We are working with older adults to try to answer this research question. Do older adult dog owners have better cognitive function and brain function than non-dog owners? So there was previous research showing that older adult uh, dog owners are more physically active than those who don't own dogs. There's some interesting research on dogs as social facilitators because um, they interact, uh, facilitate yeah, interactions with neighbors and, and others in the community. And we know that physical activity and social connectedness are really important for brain health, um, but nobody's really pieced it together and looked to see if, if dog ownership protects um, against cognitive decline and brain decline. So we're collecting all sorts of data for this study. We're trying to recruit a bunch of, um, well, 20 to 30 dog owners and non-dog owners. And we're doing a whole battery of cognitive tests. We're scanning brains. We're doing a battery of physical function, like the timed up and go. Um, of course, we're collecting objective physical activity data um, and a bunch of surveys. So this study is just getting off the ground. We just had our first few applicants um, last week. So that's an observational study, just looking to see if there are differences between dog owners and non-dog owners with our outcome being brain and cognitive health. The kid study, so the other end of the, the life spectrum, you'll see that the direction my lab is going is really, it started with um, primarily adult samples and now I'm really focused on youth and older adults. So with the kid study, this is really being led by um, a PhD student in my lab, um, where our research question is, how much physical activity do kids get with the family dog? And does dog walking and play make up a significant portion of their total physical activity? So there's research showing that um, kids with a family dog are more active than kids without, or at least there's, a, there's some mixed evidence, but the majority of studies show that. But there's very few studies that actually pair up um, objective physical activity data from a monitor, um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. The data we're collecting, we're putting uh, accelerometers on all members of the family, including the dog. So even the dog's gonna wear an actograph on their collar. And we're using a version of the actograph that has um, a Bluetooth feature. So we're gonna be able to actually tell when kids are active with the dog. Um, so that's the piece that's missing from the previous literature. Um, confirming that it's not just that kids with a dog are more active than kids without a dog, but that they're actually getting a meaningful amount of physical activity with the dog. And we'll, of course, measure um, some other psychosocial stuff. So strength of the child-dog bond. Um, we're interested in screen time and sensory behavior and social, social emotional health outcomes. So those, again, those are studies that are observational. We're not manipulating anything. We're just looking to see what's going on um, in families that own dogs and in older adults with and without dogs. All right, here are a couple examples of experimental studies that we've done in the lab. Um, the SPOT study and the BUDDY study. So these are both interventions. So we'll start with SPOT. You guys can tell I, I, I'm a, I like to study logos and I have a great topic for cute study logos. So the SPOT study was the very first project that I, I ran when I got my job at UMass Amherst and it was funded by the ACSM Foundation. So SPOT stood for Stealth Pet Obedience Training Study. And what I was trying to do with this study was essentially strengthen the dog owner bond to increase physical activity as a side effect. So obedience training can strengthen the dog owner bond by improving people's ability to communicate with their dog. Um, the dog's behavior might improve, so will hopefully improve. So the idea here is that it wasn't a traditional physical activity intervention. It wasn't promoted as, hey, want to get out active, want to walk more, come do this uh, study. It was come train your dog, uh, learn to better communicate with your dog, and I was hoping that um, physical activity would increase through dog walking as a side effect. And one of the main reasons I wanted to do it this way was because I really wanted to reach people that would never walk in the door for a traditional physical activity intervention, but might um, be motivated by free dog training. So I randomized 41 inactive dog owners to receive uh, basic obedience training or um, they, to a waitlist control group, which just means they kind of hung tight and didn't change anything until after the study, and then they got the obedience training class. So we measured physical activity at baseline before, they, before the trial started at six weeks, so at the end of the obedience training class, and again at 12 weeks to see if anything stuck. So this was a small study, and we didn't see anything 
really exciting, but we saw some interesting trends. So you're looking at the physical activity and sedentary behavior data. So the figure on the left is the, is the um, average steps per day. So the dark bar is the intervention group that got the obedience training, and the light gray bar is the control group. So we saw a slight uptick in daily steps in the group that did the obedience training. Um, but again, it wasn't a major change. Um, and in sedentary behavior, I will note that this trial kind of ran into winter in New England. So this was kind of a promising or interesting finding that our intervention group kind of held steady in terms of sedentary behavior, or our control group became more sedentary with the onset of winter. So pilot study, I think this approach warrants further investigation, but here's one example of um, an experimental study done in my lab, the spot. And the second and final uh, specific study example I'll give is a project I ran called the Buddy Study. So I admit this is my favorite study that we've ever done, also the hardest study. It was just a single arm feasibility trial. So we just had, I think we consented 18 individuals and 11 uh, completed the study, but those 11 participants fostered a shelter dog for six weeks and they were all given the option to adopt the shelter dog at the completion of the foster period. And again, we measured changes in physical activity and psychosocial well-being um, after the six week foster period and then at a 12 week follow up to see if anything stuck. So here we go. So these individuals, um, again, took a homeless dog into their home for six weeks and you're looking at the changes in steps per day on the left and sedentary behavior on the right. So each one of these bars is an individual participant. So you can see that some individuals had humongous changes in their steps. So eight, nine, 10, and 11, those people all had increases of between 2,000 and 4,000 steps per day after taking a shelter dog into their home. But of course, there are some people that had very little change and one individual that had a big drop. Sedentary behavior, again, you see a lot of bars going downwards indicating um, decreases in minutes per day spent sitting. So again, tiny sample, but some interesting stuff going on here with changes in physical activity and sedentary behavior upon taking a dog into one's home. And here are the psychosocial changes. So with this, these figures, you're seeing the blue bars are the baseline data and the orange bars are the six week data. Um, and again, one through 11 are all individual study participants. So in terms of perceived stress, all over the place in this study, which makes sense because fostering a dog is stressful. It's like having a baby. It is wonderful, but it is incredibly stressful. Depressive symptoms were a little bit more consistent. We had more people that had a reported drop in depressive symptoms over the six weeks. With a tiny sample though, we did have one individual who had a major life event during this study. So had major increases in stress and depressive symptoms. You can see in number six. And in terms of our averages that really skewed our data and made it sort of uh, look less exciting at, at the group level. The, the most exciting outcome from this study is that all 11 shelter dogs that were fostered in the study ended up in their forever homes. So eight of 11 ended up with their, um, the study participant adopted the dog and then three uh, we found homes for quite easily. So that was a fun, um, fun outcome. All right, so so that's sort of what I study so with some examples of the projects that I've done in my lab. Why do I think this stuff is so important? Why am I so passionate about it? Just one slide here, because I think this audience doesn't need to be convinced about the importance of physical activity. I feel that physical activity is arguably the most important thing uh, that people can do for their health and well-being. And I pulled just these, uh, these nice figures from the CDC website summarizing the health benefits for youth and adults which I think this audience is probably pretty familiar with. I wanted to include one slide on sort of this, to summarize the literature on what we already know about dog ownership and physical activity. Um, we know the most about uh, the adult population. There's been a bunch of reviews that in general show that dog owners are more physically active than non-dog owners and that individuals who walk their dogs are more likely to meet physical activity guidelines than those who do not. So nothing super shocking there. The major limitation of the literature 
literature is that it's predominantly cross-sectional. So we can't say that getting a dog makes someone more active. It's also possible that more active people choose to become dog owners. So that is a, um, there are some studies that have followed people upon getting a dog, but they haven't followed them very long. Samples have been small, findings are mixed. There is much less literature with kids and older adults. With kids, again, the majority of studies or a good number of studies have found positive associations between family dog ownership and youth physical activity. But again, we don't know if getting a dog makes kids more active. And there's some limitations with measurement that I alluded to before in terms of how much physical activity kids are actually getting with the dog. And then with older adults, maybe I can't say for sure if it's more literature than kids, definitely less than the general adult population. But there's some promising findings there too, that older adult dog owners are more active and have better physical function um, than those who do not own dogs. Okay, so that's kind of what the literature says. And I will mention that across all the age groups, we need more intervention studies. So I only know of one intervention with kids and one with older adults that actually tried to increase physical activity through dog walking and play. All the intervention studies with adults, I shouldn't say all, the majority, are small pilot studies, so still much more needs to be done in that area. So why do I think this particular form of physical activity is so great? I want to talk a little bit about that. Make sure I'm on, doing okay with my time here. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to give you guys my thoughts on why I think dog walking is a great form of physical activity promote to promote from both an individual and population health sort of perspective. So let's start at the individual level, why I think this can be so motivating for individual people. I'll start by saying that my background is psychology. I got my undergraduate degree in psychology, and my favorite professor is this man, Dr. Glenn Gare, who is an evolutionary psychologist. So he really shaped the way that I think about physical inactivity and other epidemics of, of loneliness and social disconnection and men, poor mental health um, with sort of evolutionary mismatches about, you know, how we're made to move or live and how we live in the modern era. So because I see, the, see things through this lens, I'm really drawn to um, the work of Dr. Daniel Lieberman and others who look at physical inactivity from an evolutionary perspective. So I wanted to highlight this paper by Dr. Lieberman that was published in an ACSM journal just a few years back. Um, and it kind of gets at why we're so inactive and what we have to do from an evolutionary perspective to promote physical activity. So I'm just going to pull here and highlight the last sentence of the abstract, which reads, because humans evolved to be active for play or necessity, efforts to promote exercise will require altering environments in ways that nudge or compel people to be active or to make exercise fun. So in other words, I think exercise that is purposeful and or fun is gonna be a promising form of exercise from a sustain sustainability perspective. And I think this fits perfectly with dog walking. So there are two primary motives, that you say motives for dog walking that people report. One is a sense of obligation. Um, people are very bonded with their dogs and many people feel rain or shine they got to get their dog out. It's what's best for their dog. Their dog loves it. Or perhaps they actually have to so the dog can go to the bathroom or whatever it is if they live in a city. So um, there's a purpose for the activity beyond just health benefits. Okay. And then enjoyment. So there's a couple reasons that I think, unique reasons that I think dog walking can be enjoyable. One, again, it comes back to that bond and an opportunity to, to spend time with an animal that we love very deeply. Um, and this other idea of emotional contagion. So the picture in the middle is my late dog, Chloe, who absolutely loved to run and romp. And it's hard not to catch the joy and vigor of a dog that is totally in their element with their tail wagging and their ears flying in the wind. So you don't get that with a lot of other forms of physical activity. So people, again, I'm not saying some dog owners walk for obligation and some for enjoyment. I think everybody's a mix of both. So if it's 72 degrees and sunny with a slight breeze, might make dog walking very enjoyable, whereas uh, cold and dark, people might be out there because they, they need to do it for their, um, 
their sense of obligation or to let the dog go to the bathroom. And yeah, I think the kid play fits in also with this idea of enjoyment. Kids that are attached to their dog, running around with their dog is a fun form of physical activity. So I think in terms of motivation for physical activity, dog walking is unique because of the human animal bond that makes it fun and or purposeful. Another reason I think it's a great form of physical activity to promote is I think it lends itself really well to habit formation. Um, there's more and more interest on sort of trying to get people to engage in physical activity almost automatically without thinking about it um, so that it's, it, uh, it's harder to disrupt that routine. So I think dog walking, you know, if individuals uh, have their cup of coffee at, and every time they finish their cup of coffee, they take their morning walk with the dog. The reward is a happy dog and a person that feels like accomplished and, you know, that the dog walking is behind them, they can start their day. Um, I think it just lends itself well to routine. Um, dogs are creatures of habit and so are people, right? The other great thing about dogs, right, they don't live as long as we'd like them to. Um, but here's Chloe uh, on her 15th birthday. She made it to 16. So they can help us uh, have a physically active routine for a long time, right? With a lot of other interventions, the app um, the text messages stop or the sessions stop with dogs, uh, they stay. They're in the home with us every day to cue us and get us out the door to be active. And they're with us for a relatively long time. Other key benefits of dog walking, right? So it's not just about getting the steps. The other, I guess, two things I like most about this form of physical activity is one that it's outdoors, right? So we have an inactivity epidemic we also have mental health epidemics. Um, we spend a lot of time inside, so dogs get us out into the sunshine, maybe even natural environments. If you're lucky enough to walk, you know, have a, a trail or someplace um, really beautiful to walk. And then the social connection piece. So there's really interesting studies showing that dogs uh, facilitate conversation. So people are more likely to talk to each other if, if there's a dog. Um, Sometimes you could literally pull them together to talk. So again, uh, I think it's not just about the steps, but dog walking can also help with our loneliness and mental health crises. So for individuals, right, can dog walking can be, um, I think, uniquely motivating and have these additional health benefits. I think there's great potential for promoting dog walking as, as a population physical activity and health strategy because so many people have dogs in their home. Um, so almost one in two households own a dog. And again, as I've mentioned before, I'm moving towards older adult research where you think, okay, yes, there are true additional barriers to dog ownership for older adults, but still a lot of older adults in this country own dogs. So still one in three um, American households uh, over the age of 70. So great potential um, for reaching a lot of people with this approach. I would ha I have to mention, of course, that this is not, not just for dog owners. There's a lot of people, maybe some people in our audience, who love dogs but can't have one. So whether it's rent-related, finance-related, time-related, there are a lot of dog lovers who are not dog owners. Um, I think one approach we can use is to encourage people to walk um, volunteer to walk shelter dogs or foster shelter dogs. There are so many of them. So I did a quick search on Pet Finder, which is the, um, the big database where you can find homeless pets. Um, there's 11,000 rescues and shelters in North America that use Pet Finder. Um, I put in my zip code and uh, uh, looking for dogs 100 miles, um, within 100 miles of my zip code, and there was over 3,000 dogs available for adoption. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of dogs out there that need to be walked or fostered. Um, there's other, other opportunities as well for non-dog owners, right? People can walk their friends or neighbor's dog. Um, but um, I love the idea of walking and fostering shelter dogs because it's really a win-win for the people and the pets. All right, and my, and my part three, why might all this be important to you guys? So as an individual wanting to achieve health and well-being, this is a little bit of a recap. 
Um, I think dog walking can be a uniquely motivating form of physical activity. Um, again, because it can be enjoyable. And if not enjoyable, at least it serves a purpose. It gets you out the door even if you don't want to, if you're tired or it's rainy. Um, I think it lends itself really well to a physically active daily routine. So the idea of sort of doing the same thing at the same time uh, every day, ingraining it into your daily routine. And in terms of those unique benefits of dog walking above and beyond just the extra steps, I think it's a great way to get more time outdoors and in nature and to meet people, connect. Right, not just for dog owners. We already mentioned that there's opportunities for walking or fostering shelter dogs, or um, again, maybe offering to walk a dog for an uh, elderly neighbor or a neighbor with a disability, or even just uh, a mom that has little children and, and can't walk as often as she'd like. Quick plug to make sure that if you are engaging in dog walking that you are a responsible dog walker, right? We wanna keep dog um, leashes unless you're in the designated off-leash area and pick up poop. Um, shockingly, not everyone likes dogs. We need to remember that while dogs can be a great thing for communities with people everywhere out and about interacting, they can also be a nuisance if they're off-leash, if people don't clean them up with their dogs. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. My two-year-old son is terrified of dogs. So I very much appreciate when people have their dogs on leash um, and under control. Okay, so from an individual perspective, um, there's some, uh, if you have a dog, uh, maybe you can, if you're not already walking a ton, can adopt a, a dog walking routine or get involved with walking a shelter dog. Um, from the perspective of a student or an exercise science um, professional, students, you can come work with me. Um, I'm always looking for uh, graduate students who are motivated and excited about this topic area. Also, of course, happy to collaborate across labs um, if you're interested in this area. In terms of, um, you know, if you're a, an exercise professional, or you work with patients or clients, I think that you can incorporate this stuff by starting by asking about pets. And um, if any of your patients or clients sort of light up talking about their dogs and maybe uh, this is a form of physical activity that you can work on uh, promoting, you know, and, and addressing barriers. Some, some barriers to dog walking, you're gonna need some other help with, right? If someone's uh, dog really pulls on the leash or lunges, right? You, that's not necessarily your expertise, but you could certainly partner with someone who's, who's, um, who has that expertise. And I'll note that I, I wrote a paper for ACSM's Health and Fitness Journal um, that hopefully will be published, and it's all on this topic, um, directed towards health and fitness professionals about how to um, support dog walking and play among dog-loving clients and patients. Just a few important considerations that I, I want to stress before I, I close today. Um, there are unique benefits of dog walking, but there are also unique risks. Um, so you got to consider and mitigate these risks if you're promoting this form of physical activity. With kids, dog bites are a real public health problem. So if this is a direction that you're going, you want to make sure that um, you develop some materials, you work with someone that can help you help families recognize the signs of a dog that's about to bite or that's uncomfortable. Um, and kids always need to be supervised doing any physical activity with the family dog. Um, and with older adults, falling while dog walking is a real risk. So that's something, again, you're gonna to have to assess the fall risk of the individual and take steps to mitigate this. And we can talk more about this in the Q&A, but have lots of ideas. I think that for most older adults, like all forms of physical activity, the benefits outweigh the risks, but there's obviously exceptions to that. Another thing I just wanna stress is that you don't wanna encourage someone to go get a dog just so they can become more active, right? Getting a dog is a serious long-term commitment. Um, and the physical activity benefits are great, but we just wanna make sure that that's not the primary motive and that people have considered all the other things um, that go into caring for a dog. All right, and finally, my last slide for those in the audience that are interested in population health. I think if research in this area is able to demonstrate that dogs cause dog owners to be physically active, so not just an association between 
higher levels of physical activity and better health, but that getting a dog actually makes people more active and healthier, then I think there is going to be an increasingly strong argument that policies and programs that support dog ownership be, be viewed as public health policies and programs. So I'm thinking about things like rent restrictions that limit families who could otherwise be responsible dog owners from owning a dog, um, or programs that help low-income communities and families um, keep dogs in their home. Um, so just something to think about. Um, I don't think the evidence is quite there yet, but we're getting there. And that is all I have for today. So thank you so much for listening, and I am very happy to take questions. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. That was really interesting. Um, everyone, we're going to have question and answer time, so please type your questions into the question area on the GoToWebinar platform, and we are going to get started. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, Katie, can you tell us about the age and the health status of the older adults in the first observational study that you described? Yeah, so that's so the dog brain study that we're just getting off the ground. So we're recruiting uh, older adults between the ages of 70 and 84. They cannot have any um, cognitive impairment um, and they need to be able to walk without an aid for at least two minutes to do the tasks that we're doing. But overall, we're keeping it pretty general. So no history of sort of neurological conditions because of the brain imaging component. So no stroke, Parkinson's. Um, and again, I'm really interested in, in identifying whether dog ownership can help prevent cognitive decline. So we're focused on um, health, cognitively healthy older adults. I hope that that answers the question. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I know that there are programs that exist in prisons where they take you know, dogs into the prison for the training, and it, it's good for the prisoners, it's good for the dogs. Um, I think a lot of it, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of it has been focused on uh, mental health and uh, probably the, the connectedness, things like you've mentioned. Um, do you know if any of those programs are also assessing changes in physical activity? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know for sure. Um, I will say that and I love programs like that. And my guess is probably not. I find that most of those really cool programs that leverage the human-animal bond that aren't all um, primarily focused on dog walking are not run by exercise science people. Um, so they, they, my guess is no, but I don't know that for sure. And maybe an exercise scientist has jumped on board to, to collect that data. Um, that's my hunch, though, that those programs are great. Yeah. Great. Have you done any work or do you know of any research that has looked at physical activity in dog owners who do like agility trials or scent training or dog shows, things like that? That is a great question. I have not. I have seen at least one paper recently that came out on that. And I know an individual, oh gosh, what university is that? Yeah, with that interest. So I think that's a great point. I'm primarily interested in, in trying to get people out the door dog walking, but I think for people who are really bonded with their dog um, and want to take it to the, the next level, that's, a, that's an, another great opportunity. I'd love to study that more, but I personally have not done anything in that area yet. Great. Okay, our next question is, um, where do you think the research stands right now on the impact of dog ownership on college or university students and physical activity? Oh my goodness. So I anecdotally feel like college students are totally deprived of their dogs, right? It's one of these phases, like most can't have them in dorms, often can't have them off campus. I have seen, there's one neat study by a friend of mine at East Carolina who did, who runs a um, service learning program where students walk shelter dogs and they get a ton of steps every class. That's the first study that comes to mind. Other than that, I have not seen any, there's no interventions I can think of that have tried to promote physical activity in college students. Um, at least here at UMass, the students get tons of steps just walking around this giant campus. Um, I, my guess is that the majority of research with dogs and college kids is on stress and um, 
around, you know, like the, the service dogs that come to campus during finals and things like that. But it's probably wide open for anyone interested in, in studying the physical activity benefits for college kids. Great. So this is a question and maybe it's a recommendation as well um, for older folks who might be interested in getting a dog and using it also using it as a way to improve physical activity. Are there certain breeds that would be better for older adults or is that something that they would just need to like talk to the folks at the shelter about? Yeah, that is such a great question. I think that's one of the top things to consider in terms of fall risk. So my thought on this, and I have spent a little time thinking about this, is that smaller dogs are better, right? So, and I know like the first thought may be like, oh, dogs get under your feet, but I'm thinking from a dog hauling an older adult over while walking. So it's a great, there's no recommendations that I know of that are out there, um, but that's my first thought. It's a, it's a breed that's, that's smaller and not strong enough necessarily to pull the person over. Um, Right, because even the best trained dog could could lunge or something if um, surprised or scared. So I'd be happy to talk more about you know fall mitigation approaches for older adults. Um, but in terms of breed size thing, and maybe lower energy breed, but size in particular is the first thing that comes to mind for me. Great. So I have to say, when I was a postdoc, I was working on a study where we um, used accelerometers and. We knew that this woman routinely averaged about 3,000 steps a day. And she came in with her accelerometer one day, and suddenly she had like 75,000 steps. And I was like, Mary, what happened? Where did you go? What did you do? And she said, oh, I put it on my cat. And I, I looked to see how many steps my cat was getting. So that just makes me wonder, um, Katie, what kind of step counts do you anticipate getting from the dogs who are wearing the accelerometers. Yeah, so I, in the past, I've never used the Actograph accelerometer on the dog before. Um, my PhD student looked into it, and I guess it's validated in the vet literature. I've used the commercial grade FitBark devices, and they don't give steps per se, they give points, right? So like how much the dog is moving. And just like a Fitbit or any uh, commercial grade device, we don't know the algorithm or what exactly a bark point is. Um, so there's no, yeah, there's no like step guideline or physical activity recommendation, recommendation for dogs. As you can imagine, it's gonna vary tremendously based on the breed and the size. So I've just really used the, the output to compare the lowest active dogs to the most active dogs, but I don't really know what the amounts mean, I just kind of rank them as dogs that get more activity or less. So I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah, the steps don't translate exactly, and I can't speak to you know how many steps an average dog gets or anything like that. Well, it'd be interesting to see your data when you finish your study. Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what are your thoughts on, I mean, sometimes you see people like walking dogs and it's like, you know, they walk three steps and they stop and then they go five more and then they stop. And so it's it's somewhat for some people intermittent. And I would say it's probably not like moderate or vigorous, if I had to guess. So what are your thoughts around? I mean, I understand for folks just getting them active is really important. And, you know, any any steps are better than none. Um, have you done anything with any of your interventions where you also try to incorporate um, I don't know, a recommendation or uh, some part of the intervention that prompts people to walk more intensely for part of the time? Yeah, that's a great question. So, oh my gosh, so many things to say in response. So first, yes, I would agree that generally my focus is just getting people up and out the door. And with the revised guidelines with that got rid of bouts, it makes me feel even better about you know the stopping and going. Um, and with my ultimate interest in mental health and social connectedness from with those outcomes in mind, I don't care if they stop a lot, as long as they're out in their neighborhoods and they're outside. Um, but from a, you know, fitness perspective, there's a few studies, including one of mine that looked at intensity of dog walking. Unfortunately, all the samples were mostly middle-aged women, so they can't necessarily generalize, but they have shown that the majority of dog walking is moderate intensity. 
not vigorous, but moderate. Um, so that's good. And I usually cite that in my, you know, grids that I put in saying that this does get people moving enough for health benefits. Um, I have not thought about encouraging people to really keep it moving. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, sniff walks are their own thing and it depends on if you're out there for the dog's benefit or for exercise for the owner. Um, so it's something, it's something to consider, but for the most part, I'm just happy that people are, are getting out, um, and doing some movement. I also, all of my studies, I've seen interesting things with sedentary behavior. So we know that's a separate risk factor, obviously, from, from physical inactivity. So that's another thing. Like, do dogs just make us get up more often and break up all our sitting time? So that's another outcome that has kind of jumped on my radar based on some of the findings of the small studies I've done. Yeah, that's really important. I'm, I'm glad you reiterated that. I mean, some steps are better than none, and just getting people up and off the couch is hugely important. So with respect to, um, you talked about um, some, one of the benefits is sort of facilitating social connectedness. Um, in, the, in the programs where you've had um, the owners go through obedience training, given that most sort of, you know, obedience training, let's say happens in a community. So most of the people who are coming to that probably live in the community. Like, have you seen any sort of um, sort of on their own? Have they made friends where they're now walking with other people from the obedience class? Or is it, or is it more of a, okay, now I can go walk my dog and I do it by myself? That's a great question. And actually that's one of the things that I, um, I, I didn't see it and like in the spot study I think people came in and, and my thought was mostly with the social connectedness piece that they'd be more likely to meet people when they got out in their neighborhood walking they did you know the, the classes did kind of jive like everyone got to know the dogs in the classes and I was thinking that especially for um, older adults this would be a great way um, to bring people in to connect um, the buddy study, the one where people foster dogs, I know that anecdotally a few people connected um, and would meet at the dog park with their foster dogs. Um, so no, I didn't see, it could have happened without me knowing that people met at the class and then, you know, had a new friend or form of social support, but it's mostly the connections that people meet when they're at the dog, well, I don't do dog parks as much as I do just walk walking. <laughs> dog parks are a whole nother thing. The pros and cons. Yeah, this just has me thinking, you know, so the American Fitness Index uh, that ACSM has, we look at different factors in communities that are related to, you know, how close do you live to a park or are the sidewalks in your community connected or things like that. Um, so this is, you're probably going to say no, but are there any sort of, sort of large databases that um, keep track of whether or not people report walking their dogs for activity? Any luck? No. Yeah, that would be a great thing. Like, well, I'm just thinking about like in Haines and some of those, you know, big surveys that ask about if you're physically active, you know, how many minutes of activity a week do you get? I'm just wondering if any of them boil down to sort of what kind of activity do you get and if dog walking is one of the options. You yeah. may not know the answer. I just want I to don't know. think so. And honestly, this is why, so I feel pretty confident in our dog ownership estimates because enough nationally represented surveys ask about do you own a pet? Well, at least one. And then we have like the pet um, industry surveys, which they all kind of say the same thing. So I feel pretty good about the data showing that about one in two families own a dog. But in terms of rates of dog walking, all over the map. We do not have good data on that because every, I don't know of any big survey that asks about it. Um, and even bigger studies, everybody defines it differently. So some will be like, do you walk your dog? Yes, no. Some will be in that, that would make you a dog walker or a non-dog walker. Some are, you know, do you walk your dog at least three times a week for 20 minutes would make you a dog. The definitions are all over the place. Um, so I don't actually know how many people walk their dogs. All I know is that we have low levels of physical activity and high levels of dog ownership. So there's got to be a lot of people out there not walking their dogs. But I don't know a, a big a big survey that that gets at it. 
I wish there were. Well, yeah, and I'm sure people who have large yards or things like that maybe feel like that dog gets activity and they don't necessarily need to be walked. Um, in your studies, when you're asking people about um, the walking they're doing with their dog, do you ever ask whether or not they're doing it like on a sidewalk or in a park or um, I know you looked at some of the mental health benefits. Are you able to tease it uh, down any further to see if, you know, nature is playing a role as well? That's a great question. So far we haven't, but this new kid study that we're trying to do with the actographs and the Bluetooth features to see who's active near who, um, we're, we're also hoping to put a GPS monitor on the dog that will give us some more context about where people are walking. So the kid or the family wouldn't wear the GPS. It would still tell us where the family is. Um, but these new dog activity monitors, as you can imagine, the GPS is like, so you don't lose your dog. But I'm trying to, to use it to get at where people are walking and how long the walks are and that kind of stuff. So we've never done it before. Um, I can think of at least, there's a study. I will say the majority of this research is in the UK, Canada, Australia. There's not as much in the United States. There's one study I can think of in the UK that found that dog owners spend more time in nature. Um, I don't know if it confirmed it was through dog walking. Um, but I have, I have not, I've also been interested, some of the, 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 um, the accelerometers have um, light sensors, so you can tell how much time people spend outside. So that's another feature that I have been interested in using to see if dog owners do, in, in fact, get more time outdoors to confirm it because I kind of have a hunch that they do um, but they're a little tricky because if your sleeve's over it it won't work etc um, so I it's on my mind but I don't I haven't done it yet in terms of the context for where the walking is taking place awesome and are you aware of any like I know one of your the studies that you described that you are doing most of them looks like are done on folks who are sedentary and or not meeting current recommendations and you're using this as a way to get them active have have you done any studies or are there studies out there where they've looked at individuals who are already active and then you add the dog into the picture and they get more active so funny you ask that because here in Amherst Massachusetts I always try to get inactive people right that's like you know I ask I, I try to screen out the people that are exercising a lot but we still have relatively high baseline levels of physical activity. So even our inact, like less active people are pretty active. That's just who we get signing up for studies. Um, so we're seeing, yeah, the increase in physical activity above already pretty active. So like, for example, I did a study with older adults, um, a small intervention, and I feel like the average at baseline was like five or 6,000 steps per day, which is pretty good for that age group. Um, so, I'm most interested in, in trying to reach the people that aren't doing a lot now, but I do think active people who get a dog will, will get even more active, unless of course they sub out, you know, they start walking the dog in place of their, their trip to the gym. Um, so it'd be interesting to study, but from a public health perspective, I, I'm more focused on getting the inactive moving even a little bit. Awesome. So thank you so much, Katie, for your presentation today. Um, Katie has her um, social media handles here as well as her email. So Katie, is, uh, should folks reach out to you for research opportunities or can they find out more about your research on your social media account? Yeah, I think my lab website is there as well, so you can go there. You can certainly email me. Uh, I'm buried in emails, so I apologize in advance if I'm slow to respond, but I love getting emails from interested students or potential collaborators. Um, so yeah, you can reach out to me through email or check out. I'm not great on social media, but I try. Um, and the website also has links to my publications and things like that. All right. So thanks again to Katie. Um, that was really interesting. That was fun. I think we have a lot of animal lovers at ACSM. So that was that was a fun uh, presentation for us. So thank you for that. I want to give a final reminder that if you purchased a CEC for today's webinar, the CEC will be applied to your ACSM account within two weeks. And when that is accessible, an email will be sent to you with instructions on how to access.
the CEC documentation. I also want to remind you that our next brown bag will be on December 10th at 12 Eastern. Dr. Jeff Conan will discuss his research on cannabis use in exercise science and sports medicine. And then finally, uh, for those of you that aren't ACSM members, we really encourage you to visit the ACSM.org website to learn more about ACSM membership. And with that, we will say thanks. Thanks again for all of you who participated and we'll look forward to seeing you on December 10th. Thanks again, Katie. Bye.